We'll start reading in verse number 30. The Bible says, What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. We have in these passages Israel, the nation, stumbling over the Lord Jesus Christ. Their law, their covenants, their promises, their sacrifices, their temple, all of that was that nation's primary focus. Their focus wasn't on Christ. Their focus wasn't on the Messiah. So what happened is, and what is being taught here in Romans is, that nation, they stumble over the rock. In the Old Testament, the Gentiles had no law to follow after. It was given to Israel. Watch what it says in verse 30. See how it says uh, uh, in Romans chapter 9, verse 30, it says, uh, what shall we say then that the Gentiles, and then it contrasts that. Look at verse 31. It says, but Israel, there's a salvation contrast of the Jews versus the Gentiles. It'd be an old, in the Old Testament, it'd be a rare thing for a Gentile dog, a non-Israelite, to become a proselyte of that nation. That'd be a rare, rare thing. But the Jewish way, what Paul's trying to get them to see through the Holy Spirit is, the Jewish way in their mind is this. I will set myself right before God. I will earn a right relationship with God. I will obey the law that God gave me. I will rack up a credit balance that I can show to God. And God will be indebted to me. God will owe me now salvation. But you couldn't begin, and the nation of Israel couldn't begin to repay God for what God did for them. That's every religion wrapped up and summed up. What can I do to rack up a credit balance to show God? And here's the contrast at the end of Romans 9. Verse 30, along comes the Gentile. No law, no covenant. But now they're confronted with the truth of the gospel of Christ and they believe. And it infuriates the nation. You know what the Gentile got a hold of? If God can love me, And if God can give His life for me, for what I am, for, who, for, for, for my past, who, who I've become, what I am as a sinner, if God can do that for me, if He can love me, I got no problem just putting all my trust and faith in Him. They saw the worth of the Messiah. Now you know what you got in the New Testament? It's a rare thing for a Jew to trust Christ. It's like a complete flip of the coin from Old Testament to New Testament. The Jew put God in debt. The Gentile now was content to be in God's debt. The Jews believe they can earn their salvation by doing things for God, not the Gentiles. They were amazed and what God would do for them. Praise His name. Look at verse number 30, that the Gentiles 
which followed not after righteousness, here it is, have obtained to righteousness. Verse 31, the contrast, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, watch what it says of them, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Now get Acts chapter number 13, if you would. And as you're grabbing Acts chapter 13, we have to remember in Romans chapter 1 and 2, we already preached through those books, but God lays into the Gentiles. He lets them have it. All that stuff in Romans 1 and 2, they're not thankful. Their heart is darkened. They're worshiping the creation, not the creator. And then there's this list of stuff. They're full of unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, debate, deceit, backbiting, disobedient to parents, unmerciful. God just lays into them. Then in Romans 3, there's none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Nobody's righteous. And just, we went through all that in those first three books. Lays into them. Now watch what happens in Acts chapter number 13. We'll look at verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. And Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves worthy, unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. You know what we got in Acts chapter 13? The description in Romans 1, 2, and 3, all that wickedness, in Acts chapter 13, the, you got the whole city showing up eager to hear the preaching of the Word of God. What did the Jews do? They're full of envy. We don't like that. They always saw themselves better. They're just full of envy. So the Jews in Romans chapter 9 what God is contrasting between the Jew and the Gentile is this. The Jew seems to be seeking after righteousness, but they never attain it. They never get there. The Gentiles actually attain, they actually receive what the Jews say that they're trying to pursue and attain. The Gentiles receive it, the Jews don't receive it. Look at verse number 48 in Acts chapter number 13. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord and as many as were ordained to eternal life, what? Believed. Believed. That means the description of what they were in Romans 1 and 2. You know what they did? Believed. What did they receive? Eternal life. They attained righteousness. Not the Jews. They're just stumbling over it. So the Gentile goes right past them. They're pursuing righteousness by the law. And the Gentile walks right by them. And by faith they receive God's imputed righteousness. We'll need a couple of spots. Well, we'll need Romans number, uh, Romans chapter 9. We'll need that. Let's get, keep your place there. We're also going to go back to the Old Testament. We're going to get the book of Isaiah. 
and we're in, we need chapter number eight. That will be, that'll be a good starting spot for this thought. Romans 9 and Isaiah chapter number 8. All right, let's try to divide this out as the Lord helps us. When you look at Romans chapter number 9, look at verse 33, the last verse. As it is written, behold... I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. The Jews, those in Jerusalem, that's how they perceived the rock. That's how they perceived Jesus Christ, as an offense, as a stumbling block. Look at Isaiah. This is a quote from Isaiah. Look at chapter number 8. Look at verse 13. The Bible says, Sanctify the Lord of hosts Himself, and let Him be your fear, and let Him be your dread, and He shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense, to both the houses of Israel for a gin, that's a trap, and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. The rock of offense in Isaiah is also known as the Lord of hosts. And this is the stone that the builders rejected. This is Israel and they're rejecting the rock. He defines himself in Isaiah 8 as what? Verse 14, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. But Isaiah 13 also says, also gives the contrast of that stone of stumbling and rock of offense as what? A sanctuary. It's going to be one or the other. <laughs> he's either going to become your sanctuary or He's not. Christ is either going to be your resting place and your refuge or unfortunately, He's not. That's what's being shown here. And the Jews, are they, if, if they want to remain as a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, they're going to break their necks over him, just stumbling right over the rock. They'll break their necks, and they'll never be able to say, the Lord is my refuge. But that rock, that stumbling stone, that stone, Jesus Christ, he wants, he wants to be their sanctuary. Look at Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28, we've got some tribulation context here. Isaiah 28, that's your context. Verse 15, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation. Here it is, a stone, a tried stone, a precious corner stone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding place, and your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand when the overflowing scourge shall pass through. Then ye shall be trodden down by it. 
during the tribulation, there's going to be an overflowing scourge that is going to be killing people. In Matthew 24, it talks about there's going to be famines. It's going to be a terrible, terrible time where this calamity and this famine is going to strike the people. It's going to go through the people. So in order to live, many of them, many of the Jews will make a, what does it say? A covenant with death and hell. Because it's going to be a time where people are going to want to stay alive. But there's going to be another smaller group, a remnant, who are going to trust God. They're going to believe God. And when God's judgment comes through, <laughs> the many that made a covenant with death and hell, that's going to be disannulled. <laughs> it's not going to hold true. It's not going to work for them. They're going to be running in sheer terror. They're going to be trodden down, but there's going to be a remnant. And that remnant will not be ashamed of who they've believed in. Those that made the covenant with death and hell, guess what they're going to be? Ashamed of what they trusted and believed in. Deception's going to abound so much. Okay, I can see how it can go the other way, but one group is going to be ashamed. The remnant is not going to be ashamed. So that's the context in Isaiah uh, 28. I say Proverbs 19, it talks about he that hasteth with his feet sinneth. You get going too quick, you and I can all fall into sin. We need to be careful about just going quickly into something. You have some regrets. But you can never go too quick to Christ. It's the exact opposite with Him. As quickly as you can, trust on Him. Why? Whosoever believeth on Him shall not be ashamed. You go in haste with your feet into sinning, whosoever does that will be ashamed. That's some bad news. That's some regret that will come into your life. Not with Christ. You can't go quick enough. Whosoever does that, whosoever believeth in Him, you'll never be ashamed. That's a good place to go. On earth, you can be ashamed. Peter, he denied the Lord three times. He was ashamed. Have you ever done something where on earth, oh, but I, you know, I shouldn't have done that. I'm ashamed of that. Have you believed on Christ? You might be ashamed down here, but not up there. Whosoever believeth on Him shall not be ashamed. You might have some shame down here. You may have some regrets. There may be some things in your life. You might have been some Peter moments. Ah, oh, man. But not before God. But not before God. Judgment, you're not going to be ashamed. When you die, you're not going to be ashamed. At the end of the millennial, when uh, Christ is going to cast death and hell into the lake of fire, you're not going to be ashamed. Whosoever believeth on Him shall not be ashamed. So you can mark that down. You can trust God on that. We see it in Romans 10. Whosoever shall believe on Him shall not be ashamed. Go to 1 Peter 2 and we'll get Acts 4. 1 Peter 2, Acts 4. If you're with me this morning, let's hear you say amen. 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 1 Peter 2. First Peter 2 and Acts chapter 4. Verse number 6 in 1 Peter 2. Might as well start at verse 4. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood 
to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, what does it say? I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be what? Confounded. You'll never be confused. There's someone that you can believe in that will never, never, ever, you'll never have to worry about being put to shame. Christians, brothers and sisters this morning, enjoy what you've got. And enjoy the life that God has given you because if you've believed on Him, you'll never be ashamed. <laughs> Qualify that. Down here you might. Not with God. Not with God. Won't happen. Enjoy what you have in Him. Look at Acts chapter number 4. Look at verse number 10. Acts 4.10. Be it known. Unto you and to all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Here it is. This is what? The stone which was set at naught of you, builders, which has become the head of the corner. In Ephesians 2, he's called the chief cornerstone. Christ, His intent was for Him to be the foundation of everyone's life. That is His intent for you. And when He came to the Jews wanting to be their foundation for their life, what did that nation do? They rejected Him. We'll build our own foundation. We don't want you as our chief cornerstone. And they crucified him. They wouldn't believe on him. They wouldn't trust him. They rejected him. But God's gift was meant for them. But it became the reason for their condemnation. So when we look at Romans chapter 9, let's go back there. When we look at Romans chapter 9, look at verse 31. It says, Israel, but Israel in the beginning. And at the end it says, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. You ever have something that you feel like it's, it's right there in your reach and you can just grab it? That's the Jews with their law of righteousness. It's kind of like right there. The Messiah is right there, but they never obtain it. It's like right in view. They go after it, but they never attain it. They go after it, but they never attain it. And all they have to do is trust God. It's like right there. But they're going after it the wrong way. So Christ says, transfer your trust from that to me. If you're here this morning, if you've not trusted Christ, you've not believed on Him, you are going to have some, you are going to be ashamed come future judgment. And it's right, right within your reach, but God is asking, Christ is asking, you must transfer the trust that you have in whatever it is and place it all on me. He said to the Jews, look, Moses gave you all the law, you didn't keep any of it. Come on, you got no foundation. You think they trusted in him? No. We'll slay the righteous one. They put him on a tree. Look at verse 32 in Romans 9. The end of the verse says, For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. We'll just smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon his cheek will stumble at the stumbling stone. And Christ said, I hid not my face from shame and spitting. We'll just spit on the Messiah. 
shameful. Christ said he was despised and rejected. Instead of believing on him, they rejected him. Isaiah 53 says, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Christ died for them. Christ loves them. And they despised and rejected him and put the righteous one on the tree. They wouldn't believe. And then along comes the Gentiles. Verse 33, Behold, I lay in Sion that holy mount, Jerusalem. They had the law. They had the Messiah. They had a place to lay him in a tomb. And the only way for them to have him was to believe on him. And they didn't want to do that, so he became a rock of offense. He became a stone of stumbling. I'm telling you, it's the same with the gospel today. The gospel's an offense. The cross is an offense. The tomb is an offense. It is. This is why parents and people go bonkers with baskets and eggs <coughs> on Easter season time. Because the tomb's an offense. They're more excited about that than they are an empty tomb. Christ came, he offended their nation, he offended everything that they thought and stood for and believed, and they crucified him. If you're here this morning, if you've never believed on him, it may be because he's still an offense. He wants to be your sanctuary. Instead of rejecting and despising the Savior, why not trust the Savior and find rest in Him and allow Him to be your sanctuary? Well, I just want to bring my church membership. Filthy rags. That's an offense to a holy God. Everything that man does is an offense to our holy God. And he loved us enough to come down and die as we as his enemies. I'm so glad that I trusted him. I'm so glad that I just laid all my cares upon Jesus Christ. I'm so glad that the offense of the gospel is something that I received. How about you, amen? Did you receive Christ? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. He's going to go back. He's going to deal with that nation. But right now, they're abiding many days without a king. <laughs> There's going to be a remnant. It's going to believe. And that remnant will not be ashamed. But the many that don't, they still break their necks stumbling right over the truth. And they are going to be ashamed. And they are. If you've trusted Christ, rejoice in the sanctuary. If you haven't, please don't stumble anymore.